I hope you're all enjoying the, uh, the winter weather and festivities. No? no? <laughs> I didn't use this, the S word. Did you notice that? I know that most people get a little, a little crazy when you start talking snow. <laughs> and um, I like snow. I think snow is beautiful. Uh, I actually invested in a couple of really old snowmobiles this year so that I can get out of the house and at least go around the field or something, just to get out of the house. It's good to have a winter activity, right? You gotta, if God gives us snow, you've got to get out on top of it, right? You've got to get on top of it. Tell it who's boss. But uh, it's a little early. Let's enjoy the trees. Let's enjoy autumn and, and the change of, of the colors, amen? So it's a little early, but welcome to everyone, and welcome guests. We, we know who you are. I always say this every Sunday. We're a small gathering, so we know when you're here. So welcome. We're glad you're here. And we've got a few folks that are out with, uh, I don't know, Sam. We're praying for Sam. Pull his back or under the weather. Who knows with Sam? But we're praying for him. Usually he's like clockwork. He's here. Yes. I mean, this guy's here at 8.30 in the morning, setting the church up, getting it on, turning on the heat, praying the place up, worshiping by himself, singing and dancing. Cherry and Sonny usually follow right behind him. So he was here. Sam was here and texts me and says he wouldn't be at service, but yet everything was up and running and then he was going home. So pr that's how faithful he is. So praise the Lord for him. So pray for him. Amen. Um, we are delighted to be back. Uh, those of you that don't know, we had a little, a little getaway to the Adirondacks. And, uh, and just in case for the guests that wonder like, why we're decorating the Y, <laughs> um, the YMCA next door, I work there, one, and two, our church was birthed in the YMCA. And so we've always had a, a connection to the Y. And so we're going to go over and we're going to help them. They do really well. I mean, they get a ton of people to come out and really decorate that place up for Halloween, which I'm not a fan of. We'll just leave it at that. But then Christmas just falls off the wagon. And Young Men's Christian Association needs to take a little bit more pride in their heritage and their roots and who they are. So we're going to go help them. So we're going to go decorate that place up. And we're going to probably have 100 wreaths hung up around the place. And they're, they're very excited that we would do that. So that's why YMCA. But we went out to uh, Silver Bay YMCA, which is on Lake George. It's on Lake George. And it's a conference center. Uh, it was built in 1902, very beautiful place, all in the hills. Uh, back in the day, you had to take a boat to get there, and you know, some, obviously some rich people bought the place as a hotel, and then it got turned over into a YMCA, and it's been that ever since. They have an awesome program. Part of their uh, mi mission there is to refresh pastors and ministers, and they put you up for six nights for free, feed you, overfeed you. Um, and so we, get, we went up and stayed and met probably 20 pa other pastors that were there. So a really nice time of refreshing. We always plan on staying until Saturday and come home usually on Friday. I don't know what it is, but we want to get home and get back into our house and have a little day of rest before we come back here. Amen? Amen. So while we were gone, we rested. We didn't do a whole lot. We took a lot of pictures, and there's no televisions, there's no radios, there's, no, there's nothing really up there. We did manage to connect to Wi-Fi, so you might have saw a lot of pictures from, from the trees changing, so we were able to do that. But we did have a time of refreshing and relaxing, and so we thank you guys for your prayers, and it was definitely a time uh, good for us. I needed to get away. Amen. So pray with me. We're going we're gonna to continue a study. Pastor Michelle was going to preach today, and she was coming down with a cold. And I don't know if I am or not, but I said, well, I'll go ahead and, and dig something up because we're going to continue our study on the tabernacle. Okay? We, I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit about last week, and then we'll move into a new revelation that God spoke to me this week. But, Father, we praise you. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we don't come here to just hear knowledge, God, and wisdom. But, Father, we come here, God, to be partake in you, to really get a taste of you, to get to know you. Lord, we come to dine with you. We come to be one, God, with you. And so, Lord, today we pray, God, that if, if, at, all, at all else, God, that we would be moved and that we would be changed by your spirit. Lord, that you would revelate our spirit, man. Lord, to change us for all eternity. Let it not just be something that we gather to see friendly faces and shake hands. But, Lord, we think that that's awesome, but it's more than that. Lord, we want to shake hands with you. We want to see your glory. Lord, we want to enter in and see you face to face. And so, Lord, that's our heart today. And, Father, I pray that that would be our heart cry. In Jesus' name, amen. So those of you, I'm going to recap real quick for those that weren't here last week. We, we really took a look at the tabernacle, and this is a, a cool picture of, of the tabernacle, which means dwelling place. 
This was the dwelling place between man and God. This was after the children of Israel were exodus, I guess, out of, uh, out of Egypt, and God delivered them by a strong hand. And you may know the story. You've probably have seen it on TV. You know, God sent plagues and various things and, and then finally hardened Pharaoh's heart, but he let the children of Israel go. They crossed over the Red Sea, and we're getting to the place where Moses was meeting with God in Mount Sinai. And this is after that, and God gave him the Ten Commandments, okay? And around that same time, the children of Israel, when they were waiting for Moses up on the mount, they got weary thinking that Moses wasn't coming back that he was going to be gone for a long time. So then they, they went, I think it was Aaron, wasn't it, who molded them a, a golden calf. They took all of the jewelry and all the, the things that they had taken from Egypt. They took all of the spoils that God gave them, all of the riches and the golden stuff, and they gave it to Aaron, in which Aaron said he threw into a fire, remember, and a calf leaped out. <laughs> remember that story? That's how the scriptures say it. When Moses came down and they, he saw them all celebrating and worshiping and dancing around this idol that they had made, which they had made out of the things that God gave them, material. And he asked Aaron what happened. He says, I just took all the stuff. They asked me to, to help them out, and I threw it into a fire, and a calf jumped out. And, then, and that's what happened. <laughs> so they were dancing around that, and Moses came down, and he was very upset, and he smashed the Ten Commandments and threw them down and asked who's on the Lord's side. And so it was shortly after that, that before this tabernacle, that Moses, and we're going to read about this, um, would set up his own tent outside of the camp. And then he would go and he would meet with God. And we're going to read that in a second. But last week we talked about this. And this is really so cool because it's a depiction. It's prophetic. It talks of the future. It talks of a heavenly tabernacle. Um, it also speaks of salvation. It speaks of three parts. We had three parts here. They called this the outer courts. You had only one gate, mind you. There was only one way into to the tabernacle, one entrance. It's like there's only one way to the Father. And that's through Christ. And they would come in and they have the brazen altar where they would offer up their sin sacrifices. And this was known as the outer courts. And then in through the first screen or curtain is what was known as the holy place. And inside the holy place was the, the lampstand and the showbread or the, the, the bread, the manna. And then there was the, uh, also the, the altar of incense. And then there was another curtain. There was another screen which led into the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was. And that is where we'll find the Ten Commandments. And then we have the mercy seat, which sits on top of the Ten Commandments with two angels whose wings touch over that. And God said from within there, he said, I will speak to this people. So that was the, the dwelling place of God. So we have three parts. The most holy place is where God was. The most holy place. Only the high priest could enter in there once a year. And he would take blood and offer that up for their sins and for, and for their, their transgressions and the things that they committed throughout the year. Only the high priest could go in there once a year. He would ceremonially wash himself and cleanse himself. Okay, But what would happen is the children of Israel would come. They'd offer up their sacrifices here. And then they would violently kill those, those uh, sacrifices just to, to remind them just how guilty they really were. Of, of death for their sin and their falling short. And then the priests would go in and they would minister in the holy place. And that is a reminder of Christ. When they went into the holy place, Jesus is a light and a lamp unto our feet. He is the everlasting light and we have the lampstand. He's also the bread that came down from heaven. And there we have the manna. And then they have the altar of incense which shrouded, helped also shroud the extra curtain that was in there which led to the holy of holies is where God was. So in a way, if you look at it, We've got the Holy Spirit working on the outer courts, right? You know, God said, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, that he, would, that he would do this work. It wasn't by anything that we do. It's not by our works that we're saved, but it's by the working of God. You guys remember the story when, uh, when he, Jesus asked the disciples, he said, who do men say that I am? And some said, well, some say a prophet. Some say a good teacher. And they went on and they had this list of who men say they are. And then Jesus looked at the apostles and said, but who do you say I am? And Peter rose up and he said, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. And, Je and Jesus looked at him and he said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed this to you. And he went on to say, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And, and Jesus was literally referring to the fact that upon the revelation of, of who Jesus was in the heart of man is how he's building his church and the gates of hell will not work, 
prevail against that. The Holy Spirit revealing into the heart of man who Christ is. So the Holy Spirit working on people and bringing them into the outer courts or bringing them into the knowledge of who Jesus is. And then they take their offering even further and they go into the, the holy place where Christ is. Guys, if you want to go into the deep things of God, you know, it's one thing to be in the outer courts. It's one thing to come to know, you know, God by conviction of the Holy Spirit. But if you want to go into the deep things of God, if you want to know God in the depth of who he is, then you have to get into the word. You have to get into prayer. You have to enter in through the name of Jesus Christ. There's no other way. And it gets you to the holy place where Jesus is manifest. But if you want to get to the place of God, you must go through Christ to get into the holy place. And we're going to see that God has made a way through Christ for every one of us to enter in to the most holy place. And that choice is ours. That choice is ours. There are some among us right now who are comfortable just being in the outer courts. That's the question I'm going to leave with you guys as I, as I teach a little bit. Are you comfortable just sliding in? Are you comfortable just making it in past the entrance? I mean, there's a lot of things that happen there. I mean, you know, all of us have the same reward, right? If we believe in God and we, and we believe in the name of Jesus Christ that he died and he resurrected, we'll be saved. We know the parable of all the workers that went out into the field. At the end of the day, they all worked different hours, and Jesus or God gave them the whole, all the same wage, right? And they were complaining, like, why did, why did they work an hour and get the same wage, and we worked nine hours? He says, he says what is it with you with how much I want to pay? I had an agreement with them. I had an agreement with you. We all got the same payment. So we're all saved. But what I want to show you today is to what depth do you want to know God? And as we sang and we watched those songs, Show Me Your Glory. I want to see the face of the Lord. And even at the end, let your fire fall. You know, sh shine and, and, and show forth your glory. And let it fall on our face. We want to see you, God. Do you guys want to see him? Amen. Or do you want to just hang out in the outer courts just knowing that you made it in? I just slipped in by the, by the, chin, the hair on my chinny chin chin. I, I, I just barely know God, but I'm happy that I'm in because on the outside of the gates, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, revelations. So I'm glad we made it in. Hallelujah. So the temple of God was awesome because literally tabernacle means dwelling place. So this was God's dwelling place among man. He made a place where he would meet with Moses and meet with the priests and meet with the children of Israel and he would speak from there. And if you remember from last week, it says that there was a pillar of smoke by day that would descend upon, like you see here. And then it was a pillar of fire by night. And if that moved, they uprooted the tents and they went with God wherever he was going. A great, great, great depiction of salvation and of being led by the Holy Spirit, being led by God. You know, God wants to be that pillar of fire. He wants to be that pillar of smoke in your life. And when he moves, he wants us to follow him. And don't pitch tent again until he says, here, we're going to hang out here for a while. And then God's going to be like, we're going to move over here tomorrow. Pitch tent here. You know, but when God moves, it's so important that we follow him. Amen? Amen. So, turn with me if you would to Exodus 33. I suppose I should turn with you. <laughs> I was looking at my notes and some of that stuff I already went over, so forgive me. And we're going to read 7 through 23. And in order for us to have a little bit deeper understanding of the tabernacle, this temporary place, this temporary dwelling place that God set up with them, we're going to go back a little bit to when Moses set up the tent by himself and he would meet with God right before he got the new Ten Commandments and before he set up the tabernacle, which is shadow of the temple that they have in Jerusalem, which is a shadow of the heavenly temple or the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, it's all a replica. So reading in verse 33, 7 through 23. And the Lord said to Moses, go, get down. I'm in the wrong verse. 33, 7. <laughs> Moses took his tent, hallelujah, and he pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and he called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. And so it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose. Each man stood at the tent door of his own tent, 
And he watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped, each man in his own tent. Now, get this. Moses went up to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, and he delayed. So the children made that calf. Remember, I was just sharing that. And they were dancing around the calf. They went back to what they were familiar with. The children of Israel were delivered out of bondage and out of slavery. They even took the spoils of Egypt with them, went through and passed through the Red Sea, which is, a, is an anti-type of baptism, okay, like we have today. They were delivered from their old life of bondage, which happens to us when we get saved. Okay? And then they get to wait on the Lord, like we get to do after we get saved. God has this, the, the time when he woos us, right? I remember when we first got saved, man, I was so in love with Jesus. Like everywhere I, lo- everywhere I looked, if I blinked my eye, if I opened my mouth, it's like I could taste God, I could see God, smell God. He was everywhere. And then as my years went on and walking with God, it just seemed like it felt like he's still there but there's a little bit of distance between us. It's almost like, okay, you're good now, son. You have a faith in me. Everything's going okay. Now I've got to go help these other new people because you were new. So he wanted to make sure that he really solidified his, my faith in me, right? And so then I went into this period of like waiting on God sometimes, don't we all? Amen. God, I've been praying for this, this loved one. I've been praying for this daughter or son of mine for 20 years. Lord, are you not hearing my prayers? Where are you, God? And of course, you all know our scripture, Isaiah 40, 31. Those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Scripture over our church. So the children of Israel find themselves waiting on Moses as he went up. It's a visual of Christ, guys. Christ walked the earth. He delivered them. Then he went up. Christ has ascended. And now we're all waiting for his return like they were waiting for Moses to return. Are you following me? But they got weary in well-doing. And then they took all the things that they were delivered from, all of the things that they were set free from and in bondage to, built themselves an idol and began dancing and worshiping the old life again because that's what they knew. That was familiar. Moses comes down and catches them. God catches them. They could hear this chanting and this celebration going on. And and they're like, wow, they're, they're really celebrating down there. And God says, it's not a celebration going on. They're straying. So he comes down. And I told you the story that he said, who's on the Lord's side? And that leads us to this story right now. So now here they are with their tents pitched in the wilderness. And the children of Israel have been caught betraying their God. Like that video we showed. You you committed adultery on me. God's a jealous God. And so now they've been caught by daddy, if you will. And so now they're all a little bit fearful. Do you remember when when mom and dad would go away and, and well, okay, I'll tell you my story. When mom and dad would go away and I'd smoke cigarettes or something or light fire, I had this thing about fire. And they'd come home and find burnt matchbooks in the ashtray. Boy, I, I got beat. I got beat with driftwood. That was the worst thing that my sister ever found on the beach. <laughs> driftwood. It never broke. The little paddles they used to use, you know, they used the wooden spoons. Those broke all the time. (laughs) Well, they were caught. And so Moses is going out to meet with God. And they're all standing in their tent door. And they're watching as Moses goes to enter into the, the tabernacle or his tent. And they see the pillar of cloud come down. And they see God speaking with Moses. And it says that basically that they all worshiped within their tent door. Get a real visual of what's going on. They're all scared. They're nervous. They got caught betraying God. Now God came back. And now Daddy came back. And now here he is speaking with God, the one who delivered him. He has not forsaken him. He's here. They're nervous. They're scared. But yet, it's funny how in the scary times and the times when when we get caught with something, it's easy to worship God then, isn't it? We're in fear, man. We're on our knees. We're like, God, help us. Let's move on. (sighs) So the Lord, verse 11, he spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. So Joshua stayed at the tabernacle. Verse 12, then Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, I want you guys to really pay attention to this. Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people 
but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. So Moses is talking with the Lord, and he's saying, Lord, you say that I found favor in your sight, and you say that I have grace, but you haven't even told me like, where I'm going to take these people, or, or who's going to be with me. And so he's pleading with God. And now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, Lord, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, I mean, really wrap your brain what, what Moses is saying. He's like, I can almost picture Moses almost on his knees pleading with God. Like, like you know, this, this task that you've put before me is huge. It's monumental. I don't know how I'm going to do it, Lord. And, and I don't even know who's going with me. And yet, you're calling me to a people that I, I, I know are my people, but are you going to be with me? And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And then Moses just continues to press on. He says, my presence will go with you. He says, then he said, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from this, from this place. Don't bring us up from here. We're going to look foolish amongst the nations. Lord, it was almost like Moses was saying, I, we, I know your presence is going to go with you. We need your presence. If your presence doesn't go, I don't want to go. If you're not going with us, we can't go from here. Verse 16, For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except that you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. And so the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. It's twice now that God says, I know you by name. I know you by name. And I, and I believe in the epistles. One of the apostles, probably Paul, says it. You know, it's one thing, and I've preached this. It's one thing to say that you know God. Or it's one thing, but does God know you? Now here, Moses has that testimony. God has spoken twice to him saying, I know you by name. I know you intimately. I know all the secrets that you have, and I know all the, the great victories that you have. I know the things that excite you, the things that depress you. I know you, Moses, by name. But Moses here is saying, I don't know you, though, the way you know me. I want to know you like you know me. Amen. And he said, please, after verse 17, he said, I will do this thing also that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And in verse 18, Moses goes on to say, please show me your glory. How many of us would have been happy knowing that God is going with us? That God is doing the fighting for us. His presence is with us. He knows you by name. He's going he's to go with us so that we can get to know him like he knows us. All the things that Moses just asked. How many of us would have been satisfied with just God speaking those words to us? But yet Moses in his heart says, Please show me your glory. And then he said, I will make all of my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion upon whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face. No man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand. And when I pass by, and then I will take away my hand and you shall see my backside, but my face shall not be seen. Wow. So God actually answers and says, yeah, I'll show you the backside of my glory. I can't show you my face because you'll die. As you guys know, the high priest once a year would enter into the most holy place, otherwise known as the holy of holies in this temporary tabernacle, this dwelling place. Remember where the Ten Commandments are. Remember, the Ten Commandments sit. And then on top of the Ten Commandments was the mercy seat. And on top of the mercy seat, the angels. And God says, I'll be there. Angels all around. It's a depiction of a heavenly throne that he sits on, guarded by angels. The law will never pass away. It'll always be there. The commandments will always be there. 
but upon that was the mercy seat. And he said, and from that place of mercy, I will speak to this people. And God is always speaking to us from a merciful place. Do you know that? But the priest himself, when he would go to enter into the most holy place, had to go through ceremonial washings. He had to make sure that, the sin, that his atonement was made for himself before he could bring the blood in and offer it up for all of Israel. He had quite a bit of stuff that he had to go through. And, and I don't know if this is true, but I've heard it preached that the high priest, they would tie ropes with bells around his ankles so that when he went in, if he died, they could drag him back out. Nobody can see my face, God said, and live. Behind that veil was the Holy of Holies where God was. The veil was there so that they didn't accidentally look upon the Almighty God and die. It shrouded them. It protected them. And this priest would enter in there and he'd offer up the sins once a year for the people. And if he wasn't right with himself, he himself could be shipwrecked, <laughs> for lack of a better word, killed in the presence and the goodness of God. His goodness is so powerful. His goodness, his holiness, his purity is so strong that if you go in there as a sinful nature, or as a sinful person, you're doomed. It'll kill you. And our flesh on its own is sinful. It's interwoven through us. We have a sinful nature or the fall of man. The sinful man is in us. And there's only one way that we can enter into the Holy of Holies and really get to know God. And that's through the holy place which is Christ. It's through the, what, the gift that he did when he entered into the heavenly tabernacle and offered his body as a sacrifice and offered his blood as an eternal offering to God. Not forever, but once forever. We now have access into the holies of holies. But I'm telling you, if you try to, to get into God's secret place without Christ, you might find yourself dead. <laughs> Many people are trying to enter into God. Many people are trying to say that there are many roads and many ways and many inlets to God. And there's not. There's only one and we know it. His name is Christ Jesus. And anybody that enters any other way is a thief and a robber, Jesus said. Look with me in verse 30, or chapter 34. God begins to tell Moses that, get ready in the morning, he says, and come meet with me on Mount Sinai. Present yourself there with me on top of the mountain, but no man shall come with you. No flocks, no herds, or anything. Don't let anything touch the mountain because God was going to descend into the mountain. And if they touched it, they'd die. Most great favor, guys. He said, but get yourself two more tablets because I'm going to write out the Ten Commandments for you again because you need them. So in verse 4 he says, So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning, and he went up on Mount Sinai. And as the Lord had commanded him, and he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Now the Lord descended in a cloud, and he stood with him there. And he proclaimed the name of the Lord. That's powerful. He proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiven iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth, and he worshipped. And then he said, If now... I have found grace in your sight. If now I have found grace, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. Whew. God told him. This is what God told him before that whole story we read. He said, you're going to go. You're going to go into the land of the Hittite, the Canaanite, the Jebusite, all of the, the ites. The enemy. He was going into the promised land. He says, I promised that to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob before your time. He says, my word comes back. Doesn't, it comes back completed. His word does not accomplish, I mean, it does accomplish that which is sent forth to do. God spoke to his forefathers and said, this will be your land. And he says to Moses, he says, but because of this sin and this transgression and the fact that these people celebrated in the oldness of who they were, and they basically betrayed me, he says, I'll go with you, but I can't be in your midst. He says, lest I consume you all. <laughs> lest my anger gets aroused and I basically destroy you all on the way. That's what started this whole conversation. Moses wasn't happy with that. Moses said, we need you not only in our midst, we need you with us. We need you to guide us. We need you to be there. We need you to be part of us. 
How else will the world know that you sent us? How else will they know that we're separate? Amen. Amen. But God's anger was so aroused that he was worried that if he got near them, he'd kill them all. Wow. And so when we look at the holy place, you know, I was jotting down some notes, and to me, this is what I got this week. We can see so many different prophetic words in, in, in the temple, and the tabernacle, and, and we can see so many things that are yet to be fulfilled, but what Christ did and how the Holy Spirit is operating and working to bring us into the outer courts and how we pass through Christ to get into the Holy of Holies, right? We can see all that going on. And we struggle sometimes, my wife and I, and I'll be honest with you, um, being pastors, maybe being pastors, God really stirs us to really presses us to get into the holy place. I mean, it makes sense. I've got to get up here and bring some kind of word to you guys. She's got to get up here and bring some kind of word. We really need to get in the presence of God, Amen. right? You guys really want us to probably to get into the presence of God. But we struggle sometimes because we look across and we look at people, and we look at people in America. We'll call it the West. I was watching videos all last night and this morning about the revivals happening throughout the world, the healings, the miracles, the persecuted church in China that meets in caves and in houses of the underground church where healings are happening. Did you know that they asked this guy to come preach in America and, and they get to this place and it's an underground church in China and there's thousands of people, thousands are being added to the church daily. Thousands are being added. And he said, how long should I preach for? And the guy says, you can preach from 8.30 till 7 at night. <laughs> he was like taken back. He's, and then, he, and then they, they looked at him and said, and we'd like you to come back tomorrow and do the same thing. He says, and then sheepishly they looked at me and said, and if you don't mind, we'd like you to come back the next day and do it again. If they have a four-hour church service there, it isn't long enough. I mean, the preaching. That's not counting the worship and the praying that's going on for one another. Tears and crying and healings and miracles. And then it dawned on him. This is what he said. He says, then it dawned on me. They don't have Bibles. He said, what do you want me to teach on? He said, everything from the beginning to revelations. Teach us everything. They don't have Bibles. So it's for them to sit and hear the spoken word of God, what the knowledge that this guy has, or the knowledge that we would have at all, the rivers of living water that would flow out of us if we were over there. I mean, they would draw on you so hard. Can you imagine that? So back to Master Michelle and I, sometimes we, we get struggle. You know, we look out at what, is, what in the West is considered Christianity. And a lot of us, even right now, it's going on 1130. It's like, mm, football's going to start. Mm. Lunch, I've got to get lunch first. Um, there's so many things that we have, so many distractions and so many things warring against us. And we wonder, how come people aren't hungry for God? I'm going to go two ways with this. Maybe not everyone's called to be in the Holy of Holies. Now let me explain what I'm saying. Maybe that's where God meets with the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, and he equips them for the work of ministry. Maybe they go into the holy place, in the most holy place, to really dig in, to get the presence of God on them, to get the anointing, to get the word. Maybe some are called just to get saved. Maybe some are happy just to, be, just to have made it. So we don't judge them, right? It's my job to try to stir you up into the Holy of Holies. That's my job. <laughs> because guess what? We all have access there. But maybe some are happy. And I'm going to use your dad because he's not here and he wouldn't mind if I used him if he was here. Her dad has been coming here. I'm shocked that he's not here, actually. He only missed when he was in Florida. When we opened this church in December of last year, Bob came. He was a Catholic. He hasn't left since hungry. The man comes and he sits in church every Sunday. Doesn't do anything else. I've asked him, do you want to usher? Do you want to, do you want to get involved in any ministry? Do you want to get connected in a deeper way? I'm good. I'm good. I'll catch him back there and, and he'll be like this. And I thought he was sleeping. I, I got, finally figured out what he's doing. He's just basking in the presence of Jesus. Just soaking it in. Just listening. He's learning. He said, I served in churches for 30, 30 years or something like that. He says, I, 50? I don't want to serve in a church anymore. I just want to be in the, in the outer courts. Amen. I just want to be there amongst the people of God where the healings are taking place, where the miracles are happening, where we're praying for one another, where we're encouraging one another, where we're exhorting one another as that day approaches. Amen. I'll let you all go in there. 
It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. The children of Israel, when they came up to Mount Sinai, and, and it says that, that God had descended upon the mountain and it was burning with fire. They were, they were dreadfully afraid of God. And they said that as, as God spoke and the words were thundering, it said they begged that God would not speak. They didn't want to hear him anymore. It was terrifying to them. So maybe there are some folks that don't want to go into the holy of holies where God is dwelling and, and, dig, and, you know, and, and dwell with God there. Maybe they just want to hang out with the comforter or in the area of the Holy Ghost where the Holy Spirit is nurturing them, comforting them, ex encouraging them. Does that make sense? And sometimes even as leaders or just as pastors or just Christians, we can look at our brothers and sisters and we can start judging them. Why, how come they're not as hungry as I am for God? How do we know that? I mean, look at Bob. He's hungry, man. He's passionate. I don't know if he'll ever preach, but <laughs> he's... He's comfortable. He's happy. We've got to let people be people. Be who they are in Christ. Be who they are in God. And accept them where they're at. Now, if he fell into some grave sin, then we're going to have to deal with that. <laughs> we have to help him out of there, you know. If he slips, you know, a foot past the outer, the, the, the gate here, we're going to have to drag him back in, right? Don't let him get out there where the weeping and gnashing of teeth is. <clears throat> the holy place, to me, speaks of a place of the deep calleth unto deep things of God. I've been reading a couple books by Rick Joyner. I don't know if you know him. And he takes some, some revelation in the scriptures to levels that I've never seen. And it's powerful. And thank God we have brothers and sisters that have gone on before us. We don't have to always, you know, press in so hard. We can learn from them. Amen? But that place, that deep place, that holy of holies place, is the same place that I'm convinced of when Moses was meeting with God, he had already passed through the outer courts. He's already gone into the holy place. And now here's Moses. He's sitting in the holy place. And he says, show me your glory, Lord. Please, show me your glory. That's the same draw that Moses had that we should have when we're saying, God, you know, I know that you're with us. And I know that you're for us. And I know you poured out your spirit. And I know Christ. And I know what you've done and your sacrifices that you made for me. But God, I got to know you more. Show me your glory, Lord. And then as we're prying into the holy place and we're asking God for that, have we prepared ourselves? Or are we, is it just a song that we're just throwing out there with lip service to God on Sunday morning? You know, those words were powerful, that, that song. Those words are powerful. Like I told you, the high priest could die if he wasn't right. Have we been cleansing ourselves and asking for forgiveness of our sins and asking Christ to wash over us with his blood? I know you by name, he said to Moses. And he said, I know, Lord. But please, show me your glory. Show me your, take me to the next level. I'm satisfied, Lord. You've answered my cries. I know you're going to be with us. I know you're going to help the people. I know we're a stiff-necked and rebellious house. I know that we've messed up and I know that we've went against you. But we've found grace in your sight. We've found mercy and forgiveness. I mean, think about Moses, you know. He intercedes for the children of Israel. His heart is right. He gets God's favor back on their side. God's not going to consume them on the way. In fact, God's going to go with them. He's going to defeat the enemy before them. He's with them. That's the key words. And then Moses has the gall, the nerve to push further and say, but Lord, but, but Lord, please, this is personal now. This has nothing to do with them. There's, I'm satisfied in the answers you gave me for Israel. I know that you're looking out after your people. This, your own very special people. But this is now personal for me, God, because if I'm going to lead your people, if I'm going to go into, the, into battle, if I'm going to take this million people and march them this way, I know you're with us. But I've got to know you like you say you know me. Lord, I've got to know you because you said, I know you by name. And then we just read in the scriptures that when God met with him on Mount Sinai and he tucked him away in the cleft of the rock, what passed before him? The name of the Lord passed before him. The Lord is righteous. What did it say? Let's read it again. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiven iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. 
And Moses made haste. And then he bowed his head to the earth and he worshipped. Verse 5 says, Now the Lord descended in a cloud, and he stood with him there, and he proclaimed the name of the Lord. What was he saying? That's, again, that's Bible language. What he's saying is, I know you by name, Moses. I know you intimately, personally. Everything about you, Moses, I know you in depth. And what the Lord is saying in Bible language, language is, now I'm going to declare myself in depth with intimacy so that you can get to know me the way I know you. Man, that was a, a sealing of the deal going on there. A man and God becoming one. Someone coming to know their God with intimate relationship, which is what our new covenant looks like today. We have the opportunity to know our God intimately and with a relationship like that because Christ made a way where there was no way. In verse 19 of Hebrews 10, if you turn me there real quick. Hallelujah. I jotted this down, and I, and I, I don't even know why, but I'll read it. Excuse me. I wrote down unity versus division and legalism versus love. I'm in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Someone said something to me on Facebook the other day. I put a, I'll just share it with you. I put a picture of Anton, Anton LaVey, and he was the writer of the Satanic Bible. And, he, and it had him with his, you know, his scowl and face. And, and then the words that somebody threw in there was, I'm just glad that Christians let their children go out and celebrate Satan one day out of the year on Halloween. Yeah, right? And I share that. And one of my brother's friends of mine thought that I was say, sharing it kind of like uh, uh, jokingly because he takes his kids out on Halloween. And so it opened into this big discussion. And I said, um, brother, I said, I'm actually, actually, I, I don't believe in celebrating Halloween. We do some alternatives to Halloween, which I'm not sure why we even do that. It's a very evil holiday, very pagan. So is all of our holidays. But we're not going to get in. That's another teaching. <laughs> I'm very comfortable th knowing, though, that I celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior at Christmas. I'm very comfortable knowing that I celebrate Resurrection Sunday at Easter. I don't celebrate Easter. You don't want to be involved in some of these holidays. They're very pagan. Um, and, but Halloween, has, I don't believe, has any real Christian roots to it at all. Very pagan, very worldly, very satanic, and occult-driven. It's one of their high holidays, uh, two of their high holidays. They actually, they actually kidnap and kill human beings on those nights. Okay? So we got into this long debate with this guy, and, and uh, he told me he thought it was legalism. And, one of, and Chris said, what do you mean by legalism? So that opened up a can of worms, and he said, I'm sorry, brother. He says, I, to me, it's just another, another thing that we celebrate, like going to the ball game, the football game on Friday nights, and we go to the snack bar, we buy 50-50 tickets, and we get some snacks. And he went on to this whole list of the things he does with his kids. And to him, that's what he does. And then I, I take my kids. We have a good time. We're not worshiping Satan in our heart. He says, and now I don't have to buy tickets for him for three months. And I said, I said, you know, I said, the only thing I'm going to add to that, I says, you know, and I appreciate your great faith. Right? Paul said, blessed is the man who doesn't condemn himself in something that he approves. You know, maybe he's got great faith. And so he's okay with that. So I didn't condemn him in that. I said, but I just want you to be mindful of this. The scriptures teach us that, that this whole walk is not about us. It's about you. For me, it's about you. And for you, it's about us. And for you, it's about everyone around you. And the Bible teaches us to avoid the appearance of evil at all costs. We shouldn't be, shouldn't be going around making ourselves look like that we're partaking in something that maybe the Christian majority considers evil. Because a weak brother in faith will stumble at that. Paul was using the example of meat sacrificed to idols. I'll use this example. This is a great one in the church today. The Bible says nothing against having a drink of alcohol. Okay? But it says do not be drunk on wine, which is dissipation. I don't have a problem with someone having a glass of wine. But I say have it between you and God at home. Because if you're at a restaurant and Brother Jason, new believer, comes in to have dinner and sees you, that will shipwreck him. And now you have sinned against the body 
which means you have sinned against Christ himself. And that, my friend, is why Jesus said, no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for another. What's he saying? That we look out and esteem each other higher Amen. than myself. In other words, maybe in my faith, we can sit down and have a glass of wine, which we do not. We have a covenant with God just personally, but I don't judge anyone that does. I'm waiting for when I have it with him in that new kingdom. Jesus said, I no longer drink of the vine until I meet with you again. I said, then I'm no longer drinking of the vine until I meet with you again. That's me. That's my personal thing. But I, I don't believe it's a sin. I also know if I drink one drink, I'll get drunk. And I also know that I'll go into back my old ways because I know me. Okay, so I stay away. But I have to watch out for you. It's not about me. In America and in the West, we're so concerned about what is my right. Well, it's my right. It's my right for freedom of speech. It's my right for freedom of religion. It's my right, don't you know? Well, our rights are trampling on everyone else's rights. And maybe it's not about what our right is or that we can get away with it or that we can do it. Is it hurtful to someone else? Lay down your life. If it hurts your brother, don't do it. If you still want to do it, do it between you and God in a private place. And that's only in regards to some things. Trust me. Adultery is still a sin. You can't do that in private and get away with it. Your faith is not that great. Okay? Legalism is when we look upon someone and we cast stones and we judge them for the things they're doing. Right? Because they're not walking the way that we, want to, we, they sh we think they should walk. They threw stones. They wanted to throw stones at the woman caught in adultery. You saw a clip of that in there too. That's legalism. The law says she should die. The law says all kinds of things, but remember, the law or the Ten Commandments are covered by a mercy seat. And that's where the high priest would offer the blood once a year. He'd pour it out on the mercy seat. So when God looked down from between the cherubim and he looked down at the law of commandments, he couldn't see it because it was shrouded by an offering that was covering the law. And he said, from here I will speak to this people. From a place of grace and from a place of mercy I will speak to this people. And so if we want to be more like our God or our Father, then we need to learn to be merciful too. So I went on to say to this brother, I said, you know what, brother? I says, I commend you for your great faith or your ignorance. I said it. Whichever it is. Hallelujah. I says, you know what's important though? Is that I'm wise to the devil's schemings. And if this one thing that you're doing will cause us to be divided, I said, then we got to rise above the devil and what he's trying to do. I said, you be blessed, brother, and you have a great time out there. For me, I won't do it. But you know what? I'm not going to allow it to separate us. See, because the devil's been doing nothing but dividing the church since the apostles went off the scene. Divide, conquer, divide, conquer, divide, conquer, divide, conquer. All in the name of law and religion and legalism and throwing stones. Maybe you don't agree knowing that I'm having a glass of wine, whatever it may be. Then pray. New Christians don't know some things are a sin. Right. Don't judge them. Go pray for them. Amen. Maybe you bring alongside of them. After you've established a rapport and a relationship, you might be able to speak into their life. But man, if you walk right up and be like, don't you know, brother? <laughs> <laughs> right? Best thing you can do is go pray. Amen. That their eyes of their understanding would be open to the truth and what Jesus would have for them. We're all on different levels of growing. Some people are happy to be in the outer courts. I want to see his glory. I want to be in the holy of holies. I want to go there, but the closer I get there and I'm not there yet, the more I realize how just messed up I am. The more I realize how judgmental I can be and how critical I can be, the more God reveals to me. The closer you get into the, to God, the closer you get to the presence and the dwelling place of Almighty God, the more he reveals of how fallen you really are. You know that? I dig in, oh God, you know, I, I dig in to, to get a message or I dig in to get into his presence. You know what I find myself doing? Weeping. <laughs> crying because his goodness is what leads to repentance. And God doesn't come to me and he doesn't come to you and say, I told you so. He doesn't come to you and say, the law said. You know what it says? He doesn't come and throw rocks. 
He said, those that draw near to me, I'll draw near to them. And his very presence drawn near to us melts us like candle wax. If he was to, you know, we pray, show us your glory, invade our church service. If God was to come here, we'd all be dead. Probably. Because we're a mess. So we get a little bit at a time. Right? God comes in and touches us a little at a time. Here, here, let me, let me bring you up to the next level. Here, let me bring you in a little deeper. Let me take you into the, to the holy holies a little bit more. And how does he do that? By breaking off more sin. He knows we're not ready to go in. So his goodness gets near us and melts all that away. So, legalism versus love, unity versus division. At all costs, we've got to keep unity. There is a time when you need to divide yourself from certain things. There was a time when I had to get away from the drug addict friends that I had or I was going to continue on drugs. There is a time and a season when God will separate you and to be separate and, and, and to purify you and to bring you to a, straight, a place of strength so that, that then he can send you back into that place and minister to them and bring them out. Does that make sense? Let's close with this verse. Boldness to enter. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, brethren, having a boldness, having confidence to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see that day approaching. It's tough to even get in the presence of God with each other for an hour. Some countries are there 12, 14 hours a day. You know, when you leave here, it's, it's, it's all I'm exhorting you in today. What level of depth of, of knowing God do you want to be in today? Because it's all on us. If you read the, next, the, the last five chapters, and they're a little deep, I challenge you to read the last five chapters. Read Hebrews. He's talking about this. And he's talking about the body of Jesus was brought here and sacrificed. He offered his body as a sacrifice. And then he went in with his blood. He entered the holiest place. Not a shadow but the holiest place in the heavenly place. And he offered up his blood once and for all on that mercy seat so that we have access into the Holy of Holies also. Remember the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When Jesus went in and offered up his blood, God ripped the veil. In other words, he's saying, I don't, I don't have to hide myself from you anymore. You can look upon my glory now. But the question is, how hungry are you? How far will you press in? Are you happy in the outer courts? Or are you going to press into my goodness? You know, there's nothing greater than getting to know God more and more and more. Don't allow the distractions of the West or the United States, this area, deceive us and harden our hearts. We have so many things that we're doing. We're so busy with work. We're so busy with ball games. We're so busy with family. We're so busy with everything that people have actually, in their hearts, have said, it is useless to serve God anymore. There are so many people in this city that don't find the time to go out and worship God or come to church or even have a relationship at home with them. You find people are all here. Don't let it just be here on Sunday. Let it be every day that you press in. Go past the outer courts, through the holy place, into the holies of holies. The place has been opened. We have access. And then bring that out into the world. Is that what we're called to do? Amen. Not called to go act like Jesus. We're called to be the hands and feet, literally, of Jesus. We're called to touch and walk in this world as Christ did. I'm going to start preaching on another message. Y'all better stop. Hallelujah. Father, we're so thankful for your word. Lord, I pray, God, that you would forgive us. Lord, I get busy myself, Lord, and sometimes I, I, I find that I just get busy, and it's hard to press in, God. I get busy, and I forsake sometimes my relationship with you, Lord. And Lord, and I just pray that every one of us in here, God, would just repent of that. Lord, that we would have a desire, a deep hunger, God, to draw near to you. And we know the promise says that you will draw near back. 
And so, Father, I pray that as you forgive us, God, that you would take us to the next level, that you would draw us closer to you, God, allow your goodness to manifest itself on us, Lord. Father, that you're, you know, Paul said, I don't come to you with, with wisdom and, and fine speech, but I come to you in demonstration of the power and spirit of God, Lord. Father, I pray that would be our cry, that we would get so close to you and be so wrapped up in your presence that your presence, God, literally would go with us wherever we go. That we would transform our cities and our towns and our nation, God, for Jesus. Because, Lord, when people see us, Lord, they would see you. And, Lord, I, that's my prayer. Lord, when they see us, they would see you. Father, I pray that we'd get lost in you. And I pray, God, that our hunger would grow. And I pray, Lord, that you, your desire for you would just be increase in us, Lord, and that you'd take us there. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Be blessed. God is good. And uh, if anyone needs prayer, we're here. But otherwise, hug on someone's neck, get to know somebody you don't know. Uh, encourage somebody. Tell them, you know what? Glad you're here today, brother. Go out in the fire of the Lord. Hallelujah.